Okay, so this was going to be a big one. This is an exciting episode. I've been dying to do this. This was one of the first things that when I talked to Alan on the phone, the first time I called him, I said, we got to do an episode about this what trade deadline is like. Uh, and so we're going to have you, Alan, and we're going to have Frank Saravalli from Daily Face Off to talk about the two different perspectives that, frankly, we never get. Right. And, uh, you know, we're in the thick of it right now. We're uh, six days from uh, from the deadline. And uh, certainly there's a lot of activity behind the scenes. There's a lot of phone calls. There's a lot of conversations with everybody. Uh, from my perspective, there's a lot of conversations with clients mm-hmm. uh, and their families. So I think it's a perfect time to have uh, Frank on uh, to talk to everybody about the perspective uh, and a little bit of the behind the scenes, peel back the curtain, like we promised everybody way back when, mm-hmm. of uh, life of, of an agent uh, leading up to deadline day and uh, what an NHL insider. Uh, when one of the, and, and one of the top ones in the business is going through, uh, in his week leading up to the deadline as well. And, and I, I got to ask this because I don't think, I don't think you get asked this much this time of year. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hanging in there. Yeah. I'm hanging in there. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, uh, you know, an hour less of sleep a night that I usually get with okay. as much anyways. Um, burning up the phone lines, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and taking the week always of trade deadline where I don't go anywhere. Uh, I travel, uh, I don't want to be up in a plane, uh, when something happens or somebody needs to reach me, um, or, or in meetings where I can't answer the phone. So it's a time where I, I try to make myself as available as possible. And, uh, you know, as we get closer to the deadline, you know, the phone will will ring uh, at at somewhat odd hours for people to be calling, you know, after midnight, early morning with the time difference between East Coast, left coast and so mm-hmm. forth. I uh, uh, CJ is doing um, an extra uh, special as well. So Sunday morning, he's going to have the pre deadline show and then him and Julian are going to obviously take Monday, do the do the post, do the uh, do the trade deadline and then post deadline. They're going to have the CJ show on the uh, on the Tuesday. Alan, for you. Um, so Saturday, Sunday, Monday have got to be three of the most stressful days of the year. Uh, what do you do on Tuesday once it's all over? Do you get a minute to? <sighs> yeah, Tuesday is is like when all the dust is settled. So there's right. certainly uh, it, it's a busy day mm-hmm. because uh, players that have been traded, um, there's a lot of logistics involved. Um, player will call the next day after it's um, the, the trade has been processed a little bit in their own mind and they'll say, okay, um, you know, I talked with my family and they're going to join me. How do mm-hmm. we get that uh, accomplished? Or I've talked with my family and they're going to stay um, in, in my old club city for now. And uh, you know, am I going to go into a hotel? Should I find a place to live? Um, you know, should I rent an apartment? Um You know, I need a car when I get to my new city. Um, How does that work? And the CBA provides the team. uh, The team must provide a mid-sized rental car for for a player who's been traded Mm. um, as part of the um, uh, benefits to a traded player. And there's so there's a million different things. You go many players who haven't been traded before. You know, you go over. They they have questions of what happens to my uh, mortgage and my rent. Is there a reimbursement? If I go get a place, uh, I don't want to pay for an apartment in my new city and my mortgage in my old city. Um, uh, and, and there is a, a, mortgage or rent reimbursement in the CBA for traded players. Wow. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that players, uh, maybe don't even know about that you provide them that information the day after, but 100% the day after trade deadline day is not as stressful <laughs> or as busy as deadline day. Okay. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I think I, I, I'm so excited to do this because I think you guys are going to have great perspectives on it. I'm curious about, Alan, when, uh, uh, when you're lining up this show, um, how do you make time in your schedule to record this show in a week like this? 
<laughs> well, I pick a good time. And uh-huh. uh, uh, today I've been uh, a little extra busy on the phones before we decided to record. And uh, just looking at my phone right now. Anything on fire? Uh, nothing on fire, but I've got 24 missed calls. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I think it's a good time then to bring on Frank Saravalli. <laughs> Let's get into it. The trade deadline from the agents and the insider's perspective on Agent Provocateur. Welcome to another episode of Agent Provocateur. I'm Alan Walsh with Adam Wild. We are here today with the president of hockey content at Daily Faceoff, the co-host of, I guess, competitor DFO Rundown (laughs) podcast and noted NHL insider, Frank Saravalli. Welcome, Frank. How are you, Frank? I'm good. We don't compete. They're, we're just one of the gajillion hockey podcasts out there. Yeah, there's oh, that's, a, that's true. That's, that's the best part about hockey podcasting, Alan, is there is it's we're all in this together <laughs> trying to hack our way through it. So, <laughs> well, earlier in the year, I went on uh, I went on Frank's podcast and we had a great conversation and a good time. So he's uh, Frank's been gracious enough to return the favor right now. And and, you know, what's interesting is that right now is a very interesting time for both of you. And I'm shocked that both of you even have the time to do this show this week. So we're going to, I'm going to try to get through what we're about to tackle here as expediently as possible, because I know you guys got things to do. Uh, We wanted, and I wanted to know what it was like to tackle a trade deadline from an insider's perspective and from an agent's perspective, because we get the players, you know, that we, you get the instant reactions immediately. You get the general managers talking about trading the players on trade deadline day or just before or just after, but you never really get to see the insiders like you, Frank, you deliver the information, Alan, you're sort of working in the shadows, greasing the wheels, making sure this stuff happens, but we never actually get to hear what it's like for both of you. So I I think, I think I got a first ask. When you see this week and every every year before the season starts, you know certain dates. You know when All-Star Weekend is, you know when the Christmas break is, you know when bye weeks are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you see this week circled on the calendar, normally it happens in late February. Is there a degree of anxiety that goes along with it as in it's a really stressful time? Yeah. Frank, why don't you start? There is for me. I can only tell you what the last few days and week have been like. I haven't really been able to sleep and it's, I'm actually a really good sleeper. I have no problem. My head hits the pillow and I'm out. So I've been falling asleep fine, but I've actually been dreaming of hockey trades and not like dreaming in the actual sense, more just like my brain doesn't stop working, even though I'm sleeping. And like, I've woken up a couple of times this week and been like, well, I got to move this guy up on the board and do this. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Like take a break. And so, yes, um, March 21st, like it's almost like that date has been tattooed on my forehead for the last number of months. There's a lot of anxiety that comes with it. And I think part of the anxiety from an insider perspective is there's a lot of pressure on yourself to, to deliver. This is my Super Bowl. This and free agent day, free agent frenzy. Those are the two days a year that you know, I, I'm supposed to bring something to the table. Not that I'm not the other days, but people look to you for news and information and they look to you to be first and you want to be first, but you also want to be right. So the big part for me is there's a randomness to how this happens. There's some things that fall into your lap. There's other things that you think you might have nailed dead to rights with the sources you have or the information you have. There's really no rhyme or reason, which is kind of the amazing part about what I do as to why you get the information or frankly, don't get the information that you're hoping to get. So to, to peel back a layer on the onion, like it, there's, there's this, the anxiety comes from the randomness for me that, you know, I, I was talking to my dad last night, you know, again, before I went to bed and he was like, well, how do you feel? Are you going to get some scoops? And I'm like, I, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, you tell me like I, it could happen. It might not happen. And then he's like, well, are you prepared? And I said, well, of course I'm prepared. I'm probably over prepared. I've done everything. I've made every call that I possibly could to get myself and our news outlet in this position, but that doesn't mean shit. Like I, I could get, we could get nothing. 
And, and so, and that's the thing, right? Is it's, it's like a, once it's over too, Frank, you got to do it again. Then, you know, you got to do it again in a few months for free agency. Last year, you had to do it for the expansion draft as well. And you knocked that out of the park, but it's like, it's like, okay, so the trade deadline's done. I did something great. All right. On to the next one. So Alan, I got to ask you the same question Uh, for you dealing with clients. uh, I know you don't sleep much as it is naturally. Um, so is this part of the year any different or is it always kind of random for you? Um, I, I would say that this part of this week is probably the least enjoyable week of the entire hockey calendar. Wow. Uh, y- you know, what the fans see, um, are, are Frank's list mm-hmm. and other insiders trade boards and, they're hearing names out there. What I'm experiencing in, in my world are, are very nervous clients uh, and, and families. And it's very difficult for some people to appreciate how stressful it is. You've got young kids in school living in a city. Um, your entire social network is based in a particular place. And I'm not asking anybody to feel sorry uh, for professional athletes. I'm just letting you know the feelings that are really going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I have wives calling me and reaching out girlfriends. You know, do you think, um, do you think my husband or my boyfriend is going to be traded? I'm in constant communication with literally every player on a pro contract. I have a group chat with everyone that sends out information in real time. As it happens, there's players who share information with me, but the, the key with all of our players is to be there as the resource to calm, to calm them all down. But the most important thing when they reach out, you have to be there. Hmm. And my phone is on 24 seven, a guy's on the East coast, the player's on the East coast. He's finished a game. Um, it's late where he is. It could be 11 PM where I am. And you're on the bus, you're on a plane, you just land somewhere. They reach out. They want to talk about something. This is the week where you have to be there and available 24 seven. So I don't travel this week. I don't go anywhere this week. I'm sitting there, you know, very much tied to my phone mm-hmm. um, and, and doing what I can do to provide information, uh, listen to what they're hearing, a lot of conversations with GMs and assistant GMs all around the league about uh, players on different teams. And, uh, and we go from there. So, so, Alan, I actually have a question for you. What, if I may, um, you know, when a, a girlfriend or a wife calls you, what do you say? How do you handle that? Or I guess you have to be honest because you don't want to sugarcoat it. But at the same time, you want to be a calming influence. Well, I'm, I'm always brutally honest. And, and I think that um, everyone who's been dealing with me for a while knows that. And there is no sugarcoating. Uh, there are a group of players who are looking forward to a trade and want to go somewhere else or may have even asked for a trade. There's another group of players that are very happy where they're at. Um, They like the coach. They like their teammates. They like the city they're in. Their kids are happy. Their family's happy. And they're hearing from NHL insiders that they might be moved. They're on, <laughs> they're on the board. They're on the board and they want to know what's going on. And I will say to, you know, a wife or a girlfriend or a player directly, um, there is a better than 50% chance that, you know, player X is going to get moved. And, and this is what I'm hearing out there. And I've talked to your GM and uh, there are no promises uh, about not being moved. Um, there's limited trade restriction or no trade restriction in your contract. So it could very well happen. And we're all on red alert. And if we hear anything, 
you know, we'll be in touch immediately. But they have to know that. So, so okay. So this is so you're talking about the the stress on the on the on the family side, Alan. I, I think you know you and Frank are sort of in the same position when it comes to the management side, who will have to come through. You've got managers that need to, general managers that need to sell assets to build for the future. You've got uh, general managers that need to buy assets to try to make a run, run right now. I would imagine that the temperature is pretty high on that end as well and stressful. Frank, how do you approach a, a deadline with general managers? What do you even, I mean, I, I guess, do you even talk to general managers? I, I'm revealing too much. Can't even ask you that question. I know it's very, you know, uh, cloak and dagger, but how do you approach it with sources within a team and how do you find their stress levels? Well, it's high for everyone. Um, because there's a lot of pressure on them to win, to make the right move, to be in communication with the people that they want to be in communication with. And to answer the question from my end, the best way I can explain it is I spend, I'll spend spend a lot of Tuesday, March 22nd, apologizing to people for carpet bombing them because <laughs> you look at it and it's not that, like they're actually trying to complete the transaction and then I'm bugging them to try and confirm or, or make sure that these details are correct. And, you know, you're, you're beating up everyone that you possibly can in your phone for information. I don't care if it's the equipment guy, the team trainer, the assistant GM, the head coach, the GM, the agent, the player directly themselves. Like, you know, you're trying to do whatever you can to, to get it right. And, and you, the thing is, and I always try and be mindful of this in my position is that, I want to be respectful of all those things that are happening because these are real human beings with real consequences in life that, you know, you could be picking up and moving 2,500 miles away and your kids could be really happy in school and you have to uproot everything. I try and be sensitive to that. And in fact, there are some things that happen that you're like, man, I, I wish this could have gone differently. And I'll give you an example. Um, I, I guess it wasn't not that long ago, maybe six weeks ago, the Montreal Canadiens fired Dominic Ducharme. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten some information from a source and I broke the story. And turns out that there had actually been some time between the Montreal Canadiens firing Dominic Ducharme and my report. And there was a reason for that because his kids weren't home from school yet and he didn't have a chance to tell them personally. And I found out about that after hitting send and I was like, Oh, like, that's terrible. Like I, I don't like, I try and put myself in that position. My kids get off the bus at three 40 PM. You know, I, I sent it at three o'clock. I don't know. Like it's, it would be tough to have them walking in knowing that you've already lost your job. And I am sensitive, sensitive to that and appreciate that. But Sometimes you don't know until after, and I'm not trying to get in the way. I'm not trying to make life difficult for anyone. I'm simply trying to do my part of the job in this industry. And sometimes not all of those things align perfectly to the way that you'd want them to. Right. Right. And Alan, when that happens, I mean, when you're, when you're dealing with the same thing that Frank's dealing with it, I, I want to, I want to address that because obviously if, if like, let's say it's an Alan Walsh client and Frank Saravalli breaks the trade. And maybe the family doesn't know yet. Are you, uh, wh what do you say to Frank? I mean, I know you guys know each other. I know you guys have dealings. What, you know, what's your response to that? I wouldn't be mad. I'm, I wouldn't be mad at, a, at Frank or any other uh, reporter or insider who broke the trade. That's their job, mm -hmm. right? They're doing their job. And I respect that. I would be furious at the team. Uh, I've had, I've had GMs many times call me and say, uh, hey, Alan, I haven't had a chance to call your client yet. Uh, he's been traded to this team. We are teeing up the trade call right now. So there for every trade that happens in the NHL, there is a process, a procedure that has to take place where the team acquiring the player sends an email to NHL Central Registry, and then a conference call is arranged between the two teams. Usually, it's the assistant GMs who handle the call, and there is a checklist uh, from Central Registry 
that they go through with the representative of each team on the call to review the terms of the trade, um, verify that there are no other uh, considerations out there beyond what exists inside the trade. And they go down this whole checklist. Um, and, and it can be, if there's one trade, uh, it can happen pretty quick. When you have 35 plus deals taking place in one day, even though central registry ramps up with extra personnel to take the influx of calls coming in, uh, tra- you know, and the need to do many trade calls, they're always backed up right. on that day. They're always backed up on that day. That's why when the deadline actually hits and you hear on, on TSN or Sportsnet, the bell go, the deadline is passed. There are still deals coming in. They've been done. Mm-hmm. The actual trade has been sent to tra- Central in a email, but they have not yet done the trade call. And the trade is not official until the call happens. Okay. And that could take you know, an hour, an hour and a half, even two hours after the deadline before the actual trade call takes place and the trade is not official until that time. They, the queue has actually been backed up sometimes until 7 or 8 p.m. After In prior a years. Deadline. Yeah. Yeah. Can, you, can you guys run us through, because as a fan, like I would love to know what happened. What does a trade call sound like? What and, and Frank, are you allowed in on one of those or is it only between the teams? So you're not allowed in on that, Frank? No, but it's it's pretty formalized. There's a, as Alan said, there's a checklist that they go through. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's who, and that's the other interesting part about the actual deadline itself. By 2.59 with 59 seconds, the league must have received some kind of electronic communication from the teams. It can't just be, well, we're the Minnesota Wild. This trade actually just went down while we were taping. The Minnesota Wild acquired Tyson Jost from Colorado in exchange for Nico Sturm. They are having a trade call where they say, okay, these are the particulars involved. This is any salary retained. This is what this person's contract looks like. This is any notable language that might exist in this contract. And the details of the actual transaction themselves must have been received by the league by 2.59 and 59 seconds. You can't just say, well, we're the Minnesota Wild and we're making a trade with the Colorado Avalanche, period, send. No, you have to have everything lined up and in the electronic form of communication. It used to be fax, Mm -hmm. uh, now email. You could still call by phone, but there needs to be some kind of electronic receipt that you send it by the deadline in order for you to then get in the queue. And some of these uh, transactions involve uh, conditions uh, usually attached to draft picks. And, and you look at the language, as I've seen in prior years, on, on some of these conditions, and they're four or five paragraphs long of oh. if this happens, uh, if this team uh, doesn't make the playoffs, if this pick turns into a lottery pick, the other team can choose to to not give the pick this year and delay it a year. And there's some very complicated conditions attached to some of these deals. That's where and some deals actually go to die. Exactly. Wow. And they're, the teams are forced to either clarify the language or rework the deal to a, a format that's suitable to central registry. Can you rework a deal after it's been submitted? So let's say it's six o'clock at night, deal submitted at 250 and they're saying they're, you need to clarify that language or something something with this doesn't fit. Like, can a mistake happen and can it be rectified after the deadline? I actually don't know the answer to that question. I would imagine they would say, since you had the pieces in place, this is the language that we would find. Except like central registry, that's the one thing that, um, you know, speaking to people in front offices, they realize how helpful central registry is in terms of, you know, dealing with the salary cap, managing day-to-day transactions, and then also trades like this, they'd say, well, why don't you kind of rework it to make it this? This is something that we would accept. And it's the same spirit of the deal, I would think. Mm -hmm. Like the actual transaction itself isn't changing much, but it's just language that the league would prefer. I would imagine that's probably what happens. But I think when you deal with something coming right down to the wire, there's also no time to hammer out a six paragraph you know, conditional pick, it's probably pretty short and pretty cut and dry. Yeah. 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 You, the, the teams can make 
uh, minor uh, additions in language uh, to some of the conditions, but they Central will not allow uh, teams to change the essence of the deal. Okay. So you couldn't say, okay, we'll change this player and put in a different player. Or, you know, we were talking about a second conditional third. Um, we're going to change it to a fifth. Like that you can't do. Okay. Right. But so you got to get can, it right. You got to get it right. You can massage the language a little bit. But there have been, as Frank said, many deals I've heard over the years. And I'm going back 27 years. Uh, this is going to be my 27th deadline where where deals have died in the last 15, 20 minutes because they haven't been able to hammer out the details in time. Now, I've heard back in the day with the fax machines that that, that they occasionally uh, broke down or they wouldn't work. There's there rumors about leaf, a leaf fax machine malfunctioning and a trade to Boston not happening. Um, so th- let's walk through it. I want to get granular here, guys. You can make a phone call. You could send an email. Are those the two ways that you get an electronic receipt, Frank, like you mentioned? I, I, I don't think there's... I mean, I guess you could send a fax. I mean, does anyone still send a fax? I don't know. <laughs> I was it's, surprised even in 2004, 2005, they were still doing it. It's funny. In, in, um, it was last year, uh, the NHLPA sends out in advance of free agency a contact list, an updated contact list for each NHL team along with the there, – there's a central – uh, email that needs to go to send notices, mm. right? Like uh, before July 1, if you're updating your no trade, limited no trade list, 10 team list, it has to go to a specific address, name and address, and each team will designate where it goes to to verify that it's succeed. You just don't send it anywhere. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I believe it was la- every year, but last year as well. There was a provision at the bottom of the email that if um, there is an issue with electronic communications, here's the fax number. (laughs) And I I got a little bit of a chuckle because, you know, we don't use really faxes anymore for anything and, and kind of envisioned, you know, some of the debacles that have occurred in the past involving faxes. Yes. Yeah. And Alan, I, I, you know, I, I want to, I want to touch on that because you mentioned uh, no trade clauses limited. Uh, there's no movement clauses. There's a whole bunch of different ways that you can, you can do this. They could be five teams, 10 teams, 20 teams, whatever the, whatever's negotiated between agent and team and player. Uh, when a team, a general manager call, calls you and says, Alan, we're looking to move your client. We know they have a no trade or a no move. Would you consider dropping it? Number one, what does that process entail? And number two, when the general manager calls you, are they risking irrevo- irrevocably damaging their relationship with that player? It all depends on, on the situation. Um, if the player has asked to be moved, mm-hmm. um, there's a total separate set of considerations that would go into it, right? Um, if the general manager is trying to send a player to a team the player has no interest in going to, and there is a trade restriction, either full or or limited, it's easy to just say, no, the player won't go there. Right. Right. Uh, But many times there's collaboration behind the scenes where a general manager will call, and it's not just one call, there's, there's many calls, but you're leading, you know, you're weak from the deadline and a GM will call and say, Okay, it's it. You know, we're interested in moving the player, and your player is interested in being moved. Let's work together. Okay. And the GM can say hypothetically, um, you can speak to all other teams. You know, this is what I'm looking for in getting uh, the deal done. You're free to mention it to anybody you talk to. Wow. Um, sometimes general managers appreciate the agent being involved in in making those calls because maybe there's more coverage between the two of you in in speaking to people about available players than just a general manager by himself 
You know, now that takes a track record of trust between agent and general manager to go and do that. And I think you have to have a measure of integrity on both sides going forward to do that. Good faith, goodwill. Um, you keep your conversations confidential. You speak to the general manager and update him on the nature of your calls and what might be out there on your side. He shares on his side. And it's a total collaborative effort leading up to a trade happening or, or maybe not happening, but you're working together. It's not often that you're, you're at odds. It's not, you know, I find that general managers go out of their way to try to contact the player or the player's agent at the earliest opportunity when a deal is about to be completed in the process of being completed. There's never really a concern with, well, let's get the trade call done before we let anybody know. Everyone knows that these things leak out to people like Frank and <laughs> NHL insiders, you know, literally when the agreement happens verbally between two teams. Mm -hmm. There's just too many people involved. You have teams with war rooms, right? Set up conference rooms with 10, 12, 15 people in there. And the idea that you can keep both teams with all these people in the know from it leaking out anywhere is, it, it, it's just not realistic. It doesn't happen like that anymore. It's remote. Well, so I, I was going to say, one of the things that actually bothers me about the no trade list reporting is when a player says no or doesn't have interest in going to a specific team, that that information gets out. I, mm. you know, that thing, that angle of the story, I think puts the player in an unfortunate and unfair position because now he has two markets that are upset with him. The market that he's in that's potentially trying to move him mm -hmm. and then the other market that he said no to. I, I just, you know, I personally try to not report on that and I always get, I feel funny when I'm asked that question. A lot of times, even when I'm armed with the correct information because it's not my position to speculate on a contractual right that a player has negotiated and it, it's in their power if they want to say no, there's nothing wrong with that. And they shouldn't made to feel bad for exercising that right if they choose to do so, because they're the ones that earned the clause and got it from the team with their play. So that's one part of it. And just to comment on, on another thing that you'd mentioned, Alan, with agents being involved with, with GMs in terms of helping facilitate trades, I find it fascinating in today's NHL, and this isn't an indictment on anyone or any criticism, is that there are a number of managers that only speak to managers that are in their trusted circle, circle. so to speak. Interesting. And they don't, there are some guys that talk to everyone that are just calling left, right, you know, all over the league, touching base with everyone. I talk to all 31 other managers and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he's getting the scoop or the lowdown on everyone. But there are plenty out there that don't, you know, they only talk to three, four or five guys that are in their circle. And that's how they trade and share information. And it's a lot of times up to an agent to come in and and help bridge that gap that exists between maybe two managers that aren't tight or are don't speak a lot or frankly may even be in the same conference or same division that actually help facilitate and get the deal done. That's I can't really I can't tell you how many times I've had a GM say to me, uh, you know, we talk about a team and and the immediate reaction is, yeah, I I don't I I don't talk to that guy. I go, what do, you, what do you mean you don't talk to that guy? I, I won't call him. I won't, uh, we don't talk. That's their and job. It, but yes, but, but there are um, uh, relationships that develop or relationships that break down over time. And uh, there are people who don't communicate with each other. There are, just like Frank said, lots of GMs will talk to the other 31, no problem. But there are some, and not just one or two, but a considerable amount who have certain teams and certain people on their list that they just will not talk to. And part of it's a trust factor because of people like me, frankly, they don't, 
want, they feel like if they engage in conversation or if they call and ask about a player, or if they're asked about a player that their trust will be betrayed. And that player ends up on a daily face-off trade target board. (laughs) That's just how it works. And it may not even be, that may not be reality where, you know, they, certain guys may be thought of as one thing or not. I, I don't, it's, it's odd how that works. And you would think that in today's day and age, when it's even more easy to communicate than ever, that mm-hmm. there would be more league wide communication. I don't know what the number is. There's probably five, eight, 10 general managers in the league that just kind of stick to their own group. Yep. Wow. That, yep. that is really, truly surprising. And I, I'm sure for you guys, that's that's normal. But to hear that as a fan, you see it sometimes in like certain teams make certain deals with each other all the time. Um, and I'm sure people can deduce which ones those are. Uh, but that is sort of surprising. You would think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's almost a version of sales. You got to call everybody and see, hey, is this a good fit? Can, it should be, to me anyway, in theory, making the team the best it can possibly be. Find yourself the best deal. So that's very, very interesting. Now, Frank, you, you mentioned something earlier and, and it was just kind of off the top and you were talking about making sure you're right. Verification, hitting everybody you know. Um, it's got to be a little bit tricky in your position because you know I'm not a journalist and journalists are taking it harder than ever these days, it seems like online for every reason. How do you consider a source verifiable? How many sources do you need to verify before you go ahead with the story? I don't know if you can talk or speak to that, but how do you, Frank, get to the point where you're like, I'm comfortable going to air with this? It's, I can speak in generalities and I yeah. think it is dependent on A, what the information is and how sensitive it is and B, where is the source of information? You know, who are you getting it from? If you're getting it from the horse's mouth of the transact of the person directly involved in making the transaction or someone who is part of the transaction, then that is probably a one source item. You know, just again, to speak in a generality, if I'm hearing directly from a GM that says I traded player X to X, like, okay, that boom, (laughs) like you're sending that. If you're getting it from the equipment guy, again, just to throw like a hypothetical. We're just gen- speaking I, generally, we't I don't, hold you I don't to talk this. to I really don't talk to any equipment guys. Um, <laughs> you, you know you, you take information first off anywhere, and that's kind of the fun of it is like you never know where I mentioned how random this is. You never know where something one little nugget of information comes from and where it can lead. So you follow everything that you get up. But that one would probably take two or three or four people to verify before you're ready to fire. So it it, it all depends on how close that person is to the situation. And you always try and find out, um, you know, where is this coming from? And then if I feel any uneasiness, it's hard to do, but I pull back because I know that there are like quite literally 210,000 people following me that are all going to see it if it's wrong. Right. And you don't, this is not a business where it's ready, fire, aim. It has to always be ready, aim, fire. Mm -hmm. And that's the key part of it that I'd much rather be wrong. I'd much rather be late than be wrong. And I'll take that any day of the week, knowing that, you know, my batting average to this point, if I'm saying it, you can reasonably bet that it's true. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's that's the thing is that I always think about it from that perspective. And obviously, you know, we have CJ on the network too, and I've talked to him about it many, many times. And and you know, it's sort of it just feels like you guys have got to be walking on eggshells the entire time. Like it's 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 tricky. Um, that's Alan, not the hard part. I would say the hard part is the flow of information. It's like drinking from a fire hose. You have <laughs> not one team or situation or trade that you're, you're trying to filter through. You have many. And on a day like that, you're hitting up, you could touch 150 people in your contacts book on your phone without even trying. That's how many things are going on. It's, you know, it was different when I covered the flyers for the Philadelphia daily news, and I'm only focused on what the flyers are up to. Mm -hmm. I've got 32 teams under my purview, 32 general managers, 70 agents, like whatever the number is, it's a lot of people that you come in contact with to try and 
How do you hone in on or focus in on one trade, one something to make sure you get that? And then all of a sudden you see something else pop from someone else that you weren't even working on or thinking about. And you're like, damn, like how, how'd that happen? That's going to be one adjustment for me this year. Um, not to talk too much is I'm not on a team anymore. You know, I, I'm right. trying to break news myself on sort of on an island in a sense at Daily Faceoff, whereas I'm used to working with two, three, four other people, Bob McKenzie, Darren Dreger, Pierre Lebrun, and we're all working together. We're all sitting there saying, hey, I, I'm hearing this. Hey, I'm hearing that. Well, And you, you piece it all together and you work as a team. It's a little bit different now being on my own. We need a, we need a Team Sarah Volley behind you here. Just well, a bunch actually, of people working on desks in the background. <laughs> one of the fun things we're doing, so we're doing three and a half hours of, of a show, uh, wow. live commercial free on Monday. And it, I wanted to try and bring people into kind of what it's like for me that day. And it's only three and a half hour chunk, but the whole time while our other people on our panel are going to be talking, we're going to have a little box in the top right corner. I call it the creepy insider cam, but the camera is going to be on me the whole time. <laughs> and you'll see me on my phone, hopefully with my mic muted and I'll be yeah. texting and talking and calling people. And you'll kind of get a glimpse into what the day's like for me. That's cool. I like that. And, and Frank, let me ask you this because you're the insider. You're, you're one of the insiders uh, in the sport and there aren't very many, right? There's probably less than five uh, that are consistently following 32 teams. Do agents like Alan, do general managers around the league ever come to you and say, hey, what do you know about this? All the time. And I think people would be surprised because I, I get that comment from fans a lot and from people that follow along and they say to me, well, why would anyone give you information? Mm -hmm. And I think what people don't understand is if you really are in it every day and you're talking to people and people know that you are, the information process is a two-way street in that I can provide or glean or, or share some tip or nugget that I have or insight from a conversation and I can tell hopefully someone in confidence and know that that part, you know, hopefully is coming back. And it's a, it's an information sharing process that, right. you know, especially for managers that don't talk to a lot of people or aren't talking to 31 other teams, you may be a really invaluable resource that, you know, when you are making a call from an assistant GM position or from some other hockey, you know, director position, call to call between teams is dealt with differently than a media call to a front office source. It just is. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's this, you know, sort of information highway that exists that I'd like to think that I believe at least that it's a mutually beneficial conversation. Why does someone take my call? Because I'm able to share something from my end that may help you ultimately either size up the market for something you're doing if it's not directly related or pass along some thoughts. And I think the same exists on a different scale with regards to free agent frenzy and conversations between GMs and agents. So without sort of revealing too much of the sausage and how it's made, <laughs> Um, there's a lot of, you know, information that's moved back and forth. And I would say that if you are really doing this job correctly, and if you are, if you become a trustworthy person in, in front office circles, you're probably only sharing publicly 10% of what you know. Right. And the other 90% you keep to yourself and you, you save it you know, not for a rainy day, but you save it to help in those conversations. Alex, I, mean, I was, I was talking, I'll just I, I well, add yeah. something there. I was talking to a GM the other day who said, uh, yeah, I'm going to have a media availability before the deadline. And I'm going to go out there and, you know, say that if we're you know looking to beef up any, any position, it's going to be a uh, defense. Ha 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 ha. I'm really looking for a forward. It, you know, <laughs> they put a lot of, <laughs> misinformation out there intentionally because they're not going to telegraph exactly what they're looking to do. Mm -hmm. um, but they do say things to other people, whether it's an agent, a journalist, or somebody else involved in the game about, you know, what they might be looking for without going too much into the specifics 
of of what they're planning to do. And and I, Alan, I, I think I wanted to ask you sort of the same same question as well. Like when a GM calls you, do they sometimes just call you for your opinion on something, even if it's not your client? Would they say, hey, I'm thinking about this or I'm looking at that, wanted to get your thoughts on it. What's How does that work for you? Sure. Sometimes a GM will say, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a player uh, I might be looking to acquire and I know he's really good friends with one of your clients. You know, what do you, what do you hear about this player? What do you think about him? And 100% there is soliciting of opinion and information. You know, Frank used the term information highway, and that's exactly what it is. Everybody is trying to glean information um, and can get information from the people within the industry, um, even if it's intel on, you know, is is this player well liked? Is he a good guy? Is he uh, a dedicated athlete? Does he take care of himself? The GMs want to know as much as they can about a player. There's lots of times players will text players on other teams mm-hmm. and 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 try to get information. Um, you, you know, there is just. In this week, really, it's like the seven-day mark is sort of the the starting line of of everything happening. And we just saw a deal happen yesterday, which was the first significant deal. Um, I think teams that are also looking to make moves, uh, significant moves, may not like waiting to deadline day anymore. And I think in the last four or five years, we've seen the more significant deals happening before deadline day. And then the, 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 the comments going around uh, amongst everybody as well. I wonder if there's going to be anybody left to trade on uh, <laughs> deadline day. Everybody seems to have been moved and this player's off the board and this player's off the board. Um, and it very much is, um, uh, you, you know, entertainment for the fans. Mm-hmm. It's a form of, of, you know, taking, fantasy hockey and and now with all these deals happening rosters being rebuilt for teams that are selling and and moving contracts that uh they because they want to have flexibility going into the summer uh and there's a whole industry around that of Mm -hmm. of commentary analysis and so forth um it's why we exist honestly exactly (laughs) exactly but at the same time while everybody's enjoying themselves um, the the players and and agents connected to players are are really not enjoying themselves mm-hmm. because of the stress involved around whether they could be moved or not. So I've got a question for both of you because uh, from a fan perspective, Alan, you just referenced it there. Um, a good trade deadline is one where there's lots of action. There's lots of trades. There's lots of moves. Uh, there's conditional picks. There's salary going out the, out the window and new salary coming in and people are retaining. And it's just everybody wants to, to know what the trade is. You know, Frank and Chris and Elliot and everybody who breaks those trades. And then they want to break it down. And shows like, you know, ours on the Steve Dangle podcast. Uh, Frank, I know you do this. You know, we break down some of this stuff and go, do we like this? Do we not? And really, we're just a bunch of people yelling in a room. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's sort of, that's, that's the, that's the whole way it it goes. So for us, a successful and good trade deadline is when there's lots to talk about. Alan, I'm going to start with you on this one. What's a successful and great trade deadline look like from your perspective, the agent? Uh, the players that I represent who want to be moved are moved. And the players I represent that don't want to go anywhere are not moved. Okay. That's a great trade deadline. For How me. many great trade deadlines have you had then? No, I've never had one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Frank, same question. What is a good and successful trade deadline for somebody in your position? I don't think it has anything to do with the number of trades that are successfully completed. It has to do with the intrigue. Are there big names? Are there juicy names? And they don't even have to get traded. You just need to be able to talk about it for eight hours on deadline day until you find out one way or the other. (laughs) So that's really, you know, and I think this deadline is a perfect example of that in that there is real intrigue as to will some of these guys go or will they not? Claude Giroux has the full no move clause. If he raises his hand and says, 
look, I'm sorry. I know you'd probably prefer this, but I want to stay. He has full veto power. Mm-hmm. Tomas Hurdle and the San Jose Sharks are, it feels like are going down to the wire in terms of getting a contract done. If they don't, Will he stay? Will he go? Like there, I think there's a lot of guys that are sort of up in the air. I, I would tend to lean towards, you know, Hampus Lindholm is in the same boat. I, I would tend to lean towards most of those guys end up moving when it's all said and done, just based on the intel. But other than that, like it's the intrigue factor. You know, is there something juicy to talk about? And if not, and we're talking about third pair defensemen moving, well, then it's not really all that interesting and people aren't going to watch. Right, right. And it, uh, uh, you mentioned Giroux. We are less than 48 hours here, or I think just about 48 hours away from his thousandth game for the Flyers. So that will be a very interesting storyline to watch. And that's the kind of stuff, Frank, you're right, where you, you, follow the, you follow the speculation leading up. And so much of what you do, at least from my outsider perspective here, is it's, it's what could this look like? Where could he go? What is he... And do you ever hear from the players themselves after a report? And I know that uh, um, I, I know this is going to be tricky and I'm not asking you to, to reveal too much here. But if you talk about a specific player on television, I think a lot of people want to know, do you hear from their manager, like their agent, or do you hear from them if they don't like something that you said? I hear from everyone. Like, <laughs> it depends on what you say and how flagrant it is, I, I guess I should say. Um <laughs> Sometimes you get slapped publicly. Mm. I mean, Kelly McCrimmon from the Vegas Golden Knights a couple weeks back was immediately and publicly denying my report, saying that the Vegas Golden Knights had expressed interest in Mark Andre Fleury. Who? Mm. Yeah, Who? I, Never I, heard I, of him. Yeah. So, but I, sometimes that happens, and sometimes you have to be prepared for. That's that's the other part of it is you, you know you put yourself out there and you hit send there's always the possibility for something to happen. You know, either we just talked about the conditions in a trade. uh, There could be some clause, a player could change their mind. uh, You know, some, anything could happen. And sometimes even something that you thought you had dead to rights may not happen. Mm -hmm. But um, I think you always have to be prepared for that to, you, that to come when you operate publicly in that space, when you go on Sportsnet, when you say it on your show or your podcast, even something you know as benign as you know a, a joke that you make, it may be funny to you, but it may not be to someone else and his family. And I think you have to always be cognizant of that, and that's why I try and treat everyone with you know the same amount of requisite respect that I'd want to be treated with if someone were talking about me and my family. Right. Right. I I would just add uh, one more thing about that. The respect factor. I I've always had a beef uh, with the NHL uh, putting games on deadline day. Oh yeah. And, and, and I think that it is not too much of an effort to just make sure on that one day of the year, when all of this is going on, that that players not have to play games that evening. They're so distracted during the day. Nobody's taking a nap. Uh, you've got teams in the air. You've got teams on the ice at practice. Uh, every Canadian team, there's uh, every 15 minutes a report from the practice rink of wherever they are. <laughs> you, you know, and I just think there shouldn't be games that night. Of all and, the beefs that you have with the NHL, this might be the most reasonable. <laughs> 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 and I've and I've heard that from so many different people, journalists, players, even general managers. Why the hell do we have a game tonight? Right. right. So I, I really think that um, that's something uh, that would make the entire process smoother and and really looking out for the players and uh, not have them have to worry about playing a game that night when going through an entire day of following what's happening, who's been traded. Um, and so forth. How do you think the insiders feel? Get to the studio at 6 a.m., get through the deadline. You do your first show after that. And oh, by the way, you're going to be on the Maple Leafs panel tonight and the game's oh. not over till 10 o'clock. Oh, yeah. if, it, if it doesn't go to overtime. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Alan, if, if okay. Now, I, I know the two of you work together a lot 
uh, a lot as in like, you know, each other the way you, people would know each other in NHL circles. Right. And I'm not trying to suggest that the two of you have a relationship beyond that, but, but what I wanted to ask you is, okay, let's say Frank gets on TV and I'm your client and I'm playing hockey and you don't like what Frank says about me. What, what do you do about that? Because I wanted to, you know, I wanted to kind of get your perspective on, if you don't like that report, how do you handle that situation? My only loyalty and my only devotion is to the client period. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to see what anybody would say and how it was framed and maybe where the information came from, but I'm going to do whatever I need to do uh, that's in my client's best interests. And I would never, um, uh, I, I really wouldn't have a concern about any other relationships that are out there other than what's best for my client, period. Hmm. So, I, and I would say to that, I'm not a big believer in surprises and mm. more or less everything that I do can be controlled and planned in that I control when I send my tweet, I control when I post my story and I control what comes out of my mouth on what I say on air. So if I had something of intrigue or something that I felt may be sensitive I'm probably going to call Alan or I'm going to call any agent and, and, and at least run it by them to give them an opportunity to provide insight, to tell me that I'm wrong, to tell me that I'm really going to make them angry before I go and do and say or type it. And the same exists on the team side with it's not hard for me to send a text to a GM and say, hey, you know, even if I don't have a relationship with the guy, I'll, I'll more or less send a text and say, hey. Just letting you know, this is what I'm planning to say. If you have any issues, please let me know. Okay. And it's not that I'm asking for approval. It's more so also to protect myself on the back end of it so that you're not getting that call and you're not getting slapped publicly um, to, you know, to help yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. Good, to, yeah. good to prepare. Right. Good to know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's smart. That's a, well, that's a, that's a great um, uh, segue to wrap up. Uh, I want to thank Frank very much. You've been incredibly generous of your time. And uh, I know how busy these days are. And for you to, to, to lend us an hour of your very valuable time is really appreciated. No, uh, glad to be on. Glad to join Agent Provocateur. I've been listening, watching from afar and a big fan of everything going on at SDPN. So uh, pleasure to join. Thanks a lot, Frank. Same, Frank. Thank you so much.